Good evening and welcome back to Byline. This is a public affairs show here at Amherst Media, co-sponsored by the Amherst League of Women Voters. And uh, we've been uh, visiting with a lot of our town council members and town officials. Uh, today we're going to meet uh, for the second time with our new state representative, Mindy Dom. Welcome, Mindy. Thank you very much. It's great to be back. Thank you. Uh, you did such a great job the first time. <laughs> I've been getting all kinds of comments and people saying, when is she coming on again? Oh, that's... And I think they actually would like you to replace me here <laughs> no. on this side as no. well. No. Um, okay. We're all comfortable where we are. Where we are for the moment. <laughs> Very good. So uh, let's uh, dig in. You're in about, oh, let's see, when we're taping this show, which isn't, uh, it's a little bit, uh, a few weeks before it's going to be broadcast, but um, you're in about 120 days yes. now. How's it feeling? It feels great. It is the most fascinating job I've ever had. The pace is very hectic, which is great. There's no room for boredom. And I feel like I'm getting an opportunity to advocate for the district and for issues that are of concern to the district. And I'm also getting a chance to touch base and come back and kind of get replenished by the district. Terrific. So it feels good. Yeah, well, that's the, the great thing about coming home and putting your feet back on the ground here. Absolutely. And seeing mm -hmm. your constituents and your supporters and your friends to get energized to go go back there for battle. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Very good. So uh, we want to cover a few things mm -hmm. tonight because... Uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, you folks were in the throes of the budget debate, and that yes. was your first budget debate. It was. So I'd like to talk with you a little bit about that experience. Uh, tell us what the what it felt like to be in that uh, in that uh, fishbowl uh, and with 160 members running around trying to pursue 100. And, I guess it was 1,500 amendments Even or so. More, I Even think. more. Yeah. Okay. So tell us. I loved it. I loved Budget Week. So as many of your viewers may know, that's our main job at the state legislature is creating a budget, right, and passing it on to the governor for the next fiscal year. And in the House, it occupies everybody for this period of time. And so we all get a chance to submit amendments. The budget comes out on a Wednesday. We have three days to submit amendments. I submitted four amendments. Um, many people submit a lot more. Some don't submit any. And then the week following our submission of amendments, the House Ways and Means staff are putting together and organizing all these amendments into different subject areas. And then we come back the next week and we have what you call a debate. I actually, I'm not sure it was actually a debate. It was more like a conversation about what amendments people support and don't support and what's actually going to go into the budget. And I loved it. And I when you say it was more like a conversation than a debate, explain that because I think I know what you mean. But... Uh, people who don't know the process uh, in terms of how the House handles the amendments may not understand what that means. Well, even before we submitted amendments, House Ways and Means holds statewide hearings, as you know, being mm -hmm. a former chair of that committee, um, where they hear from the administration as to what they want, advocacy organizations and individuals as to what they want. They also, the chair of House Ways and Means, gives his schedule to members for like two months saying that if you want to meet with them for 15 minutes and give them like a 15-minute pitch on what your district needs or what your statewide concerns are, you can do that, which I did. Yeah. Um, I went and met with the chair and I brought two letters. One was specific to the district and one was about statewide issues that are of concern to the district. And then that staff takes all that information and creates a draft budget. And then we look at that budget as members and we get to say they didn't include the things I wanted, so I'm going to go in and try to amend it. Then during budget week, each of those subject areas, education, energy and the environment, um, transportation, has a set time where we go into room 348. It's not mysterious. It's actually just a room. Um, and the House Ways and Means leadership is there, as well as the chairs from these committees. And every member who wants to speak on an amendment goes into that room and has their time to say, you know, I hope that you'll consider putting this amendment back in and gives a little explanation why. Some members do it about one amendment, maybe their own. Other people will go in and give a slew of amendments. And I love that part because we really get to see not only what my colleagues are concerned about and what their districts want and what projects are important to them, but what their advocacy style is and what their priorities are. 
and nobody is adversarial in the room. So it's really just advocacy without animus. Mm -hmm. um, I loved it. Um, I went to every single meeting um, from start to finish. I scheduled myself to talk at the end after I heard everybody, and I'm still junior, and I want to see what people do. Um, and I felt like I really walked away with a better understanding of the Commonwealth and about the specific members in the room. How long was that meeting? Those meetings, well, they depends on what the subject area is, but it could go up to about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. So it wasn't mm -hmm. really debate in that way. It was yeah. more like a conversation. Um, a colleague of mine said it felt like being at a Thanksgiving table because it's a, it's a, we're around mm -hmm. a round table and people come forward and say, here's what is of concern to me. I thought it was a really How wonderful many members way. were in a typical, and it's only members, it's correct? It's only members of yeah. the house, and so it wasn't 160 people, but the really packed room could be probably about, at any given time, maybe 30 to 40 people. And then after, most people, after they gave their Speak, speech, they, they leave. left. A lot of the newly electeds, and I did not. I stayed there for the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so I got to see also how veteran legislators and non-veteran legislators would res would approach the leadership and how they would make their pitch. And then what happens after that one hour or so meeting is over? Then there, you know, then the leadership sort of takes in all that information and I saw the spreadsheet that they used to sort of record our presentations which mm -hmm. was really intricate and poof they develop a consolidated amendment where they take in some of the amendments and they create a whole new amendment to that section, which includes some of the things that members had asked for and wanted, and that's what we debate and discuss and vote on. And at that point, your amendment might be still left out. Right. It might be put in in part. Right. Or put it may in put in, in exactly as you wanted. Right. It. And so my, I'm going uh, two for three. So I asked for two local amendments. And I did not get them in full. I got them in part, which is good because it's something. And now that budget goes to the Senate, so maybe they'll add in a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And one of my amendments I didn't get at all, which was, um, and was kind of statewide, but also had direct local impact. It was to increase the UMass budget by $10.2 million to freeze undergraduate tuition, tuition. for mm -hmm. the next year. Mm -hmm. And that was not put in. But who knows, maybe the Senate will put it in. Well, they typically look to the Senate to... Uh, Add for high, add higher education spending. It's been a pattern for decades, decades. Occasionally, the House will uh, will um, match the governor's mm -hmm. number, and the Senate will match that number. But for the most part, the governor has the low number, the House has one that's a little bit higher, right. and then the Senate adds some, well, more, some more. And then they'll have to figure between the House and the Senate. At that point, they'll have to come up with their what the, the what the uh, compromise right. number is going to be. So. Um, Let's talk, uh, before we go into the detail about mm -hmm. the other amendments mm -hmm. that you filed and that you got uh, in whole or part, um, a lot of people criticize the consolidated mm -hmm. amendment process because it's all behind the scenes mm -hmm. and the public doesn't get to hear a debate on each of the amendments mm -hmm. and it doesn't get to um, see a vote on each of the mm -hmm. amendments. When a vote is taken, it's mm -hmm. taken on a whole pile of amendments at the same time. Right. So there could be 10, 20, 50, 100 amendments mm -hmm. embedded in that one Absolutely. vote. Absolutely. So uh, t tell me your perspective on that because, again, we're, we're very big on transparency right. around here and people really want to understand how that works and how you feel as a... Uh, as a uh, representative uh, using that process. This particular budget, I felt okay about it because I also thought that the budget the House Ways and Means provided us with initially was a really pretty good budget. Like it increased money for housing and homelessness services. It increased money for adult education. It increased money for libraries, HIV AIDS funding. There were a lot of pieces um, of the budget that we were originally given that I thought really focused on vulnerable populations and increased support for those folks. Um, people with developmental disabilities, the programs that serve them were increased a great deal. So that left me with a lot of feeling of trust, to tell you the truth, to leadership. And I do like the people who are in leadership in ways and means. They come to that from like the mental health field, um, the drug and alcohol treatment field, the nursing field. Um, 
so that and i'm new so i know i can't write a budget because i'm still figuring that out if the budget had been very different i probably might feel very different about mm -hmm. the process but because i felt like the budget really lived up to a lot of expectations it really did a great job with child care and early education before we even touched it mm -hmm. um, that made me feel like i could have faith plus i don't really want to sit and um, have thirty minute debates on all the amendments that i heard about in room three forty eight mm -hmm. you know the dog park in another community the mm -hmm. the fire hydrant that needs to be repaired like all the i think it's fine that they had an opportunity that my colleagues had an opportunity to say this is what my constituents need and that i got a chance to learn about it but debate it for thirty minutes i don't know if that's the best time for um, members of the house um, in a different scenario, I might feel very differently about the process. This time around for my first one, I liked it. And it also, like I said, it gave me an opportunity to hear information from other members that I can use in building future coalitions mm -hmm. that I otherwise would not have would gotten. Not have heard. Um, so. Okay. And how about the uh, actual debate and vote on the consolidated amendment. Was there debate on most there of them? There was. Uh, well, there wasn't debate, but there was a couple of sections where people pulled things out and were able to debate it. Okay. Um, and and so that's because they were not satisfied and wanted right. another bite at the apple. Exactly. And so there is an opportunity, if you want, if you're like, I'm mad that they didn't do $10.2 million for UMass for a freeze. I could have mm -hmm. taken that and called for a roll call vote on it. I decided not to do that with that because I really just wanted a conversation to happen and maybe that conversation will continue onto the Senate. Mm -hmm. um, but there were a couple of members who pulled things out and we debated them and they were voted down. In some cases they were voted down. I'm trying to think if there was one that was, I think there was one that was approved, but I forget what it was. Um, and so that worked and out well. And was that on a roll call vote? Yes, and so that worked out well for that member. And what that was against leadership's intention? Well, or it was just against um, the budget as it, as it existed. As it existed. There was also... You mean uh, that amendment as yes. it existed? Yes. Yeah. I think that happened twice, that there were two okay. amendments that were brought up. So that means that the people who are bringing them up don't agree with what leadership right. in the Ways and Means did. Yeah. Um, and their amendments actually passed. So that meant that the body could weigh in on that. Um, and there were a couple amendments that didn't pass. Okay. So let's talk about uh, the specific amendments of yours that did pass. Let's start with one that's really critical, which is Craig's Door, mm -hmm. which has been something that this community has made available, which very few communities do, which yes. is uh, a winter shelter for uh, people with uh, substance abuse problems. Yep. And most, uh, most uh, shelters are what are called dry shelters. Yep. This one is not, you, you cannot be using in the shelter, mm -hmm. but um, you, uh, you can stay there uh, even if you're not in recovery at the moment. Right, and if you're not sober at the moment. And if you're not sober at the moment, and uh, so it's uh, a well-staffed and well-managed facility. Mm -hmm. And for years, we've been getting an earmark Starting with you, that. I think, yes. Yes, uh, and, and Representative Ellen's story mm -hmm. was actually the one who started that with uh, earmarks in the House budget, and then I picked it up in the Senate, and um, we made sure that it got done. But we ran into a little bit of problem last year, and um, so uh, a new scenario was worked out, which is now actually being implemented mm -hmm. through this budget. Yep, hopefully. So why don't you describe that for us? So I think that um, I think we all thought that homeless services shouldn't be subject to an earmark, right? If we think that everybody should have a place to stay at night, especially in the winter, then it shouldn't be subject to this special appeal. It should be part of the program, right? And I think what's happened in the past years when it was an earmark, depending on what our revenues were in the end of the calendar year, sometimes it would be dangled and we're not sure if we can fund it right in the middle of the winter, right in the middle when uh, organizations like Craig's Doors need certainty and stability, it was always maybe yes, maybe no. So when I came in, I also didn't want one of my earmark requests to always be um, for only one nonprofit or human yeah. service organization because we have a lot of them in the Third Hampshire and I think that I really want to be able to sort of spread the love. So when I came in, what had already been in works by you as well as other, my predecessor was trying to see if we could get it within the line that the governor's budget has mm -hmm. and right now that's where it is and so one of my earmarks was just to make sure that that happened in that line 
but that means that the house doesn't have to add money into that line right. and that's a big plus and to the administration's credit yes. they included it in their budget absolutely to house ways and means credit and to your credit it's included in the it's house included. budget and now hopefully uh, senator comerford will be able to hold that in place in the senate budget yes. And that will be a permanent solution to this problem, yes. not an annual fight to get exactly. the earmarks. So that's terrific. And isn't this also going to involve a partnership with another agency? I think that hasn't yet happened, but I think that this potentially gives um, sort of more support if that, if that was an option that people wanted to okay. choose to do. And I think that the other piece of making sure that it's in there is that the House budget, because when the original house budget increased the line for ha housing and homelessness services that actually protected the mm -hmm. Craig Storrs funds so that's, that's great. a great thing terrific okay uh, what was the uh, other budget amendment that, um, uh, and I uh, the two other ones that I did that were very local was a request for the John Musanti Health Center which I got a part of which is terrific as a new access point for medical care for not only Amherst and Pelham and Granby but the whole area and the other piece was a part of funding that the towns of Amherst and Pelham were looking for to be able to do a feasibility study on, a, on congregate energy and choice and okay. community choice around energy. And they're doing that in partnership with Northampton to not only do an aggregation around energy just to be able to save folks money, but they want to have this extra element of save money and reduce fossil fuels. Fantastic. And so that's, I'm really excited about that. I'm very excited about that too because I put the original aggregation, municipal aggregation language in the bill that uh, created the uh, utility deregulation, which then um, led to a number of places, but not yet here, well, aggregating hopefully. energy purchase for uh, savings. So your work continues. And, uh, well, it takes a long time for some of these things to get uh, actually get implemented. So I'm really glad that um, here you are. Uh, let's see, you're the fourth uh, state rep after me, <laughs> and uh, you're actually bringing that to life. So well, thank you. Thanks to the towns of Amherst and Pelham for wanting to do it. <laughs> That's great. OK, so um, let's uh, shift gears here for a second. Um, you had some very interesting constitutional amendments that you proposed. I did. And uh, by the time the viewers are watching this, the deadline will have come and gone yes. for legislative action. Mm -hmm. But tell us about the hearing and the prognosis today about what you think is likely to happen okay, on those. So today, uh, the hearing that the Joint Committee on the Judiciary had was terrific. I had two amendments. One would allow everybody, not just people who identify as Quakers, who are public officials, to not only swear in their oath, but if they chose, they could affirm their oath. Right now, according to the Massachusetts Constitution, on, that's only res that choice is only reserved for people who are Quakers. Everybody else has to swear in their oath. So the amendment for that is to give the choice to everybody. Um, and the uh, second amendment was And to, that one's moving And that positively. one's moving along. So as a result of the hearing, the committee took that in. They amended it a little bit in a really good way, which I'll talk about in a moment. And they have, um, I guess, reported it out with an ought to pass piece. And so actually, as we speak right now, next week, I expect that the House will be voting on that um, because May 8th is the deadline to vote on constitutional amendments. Constitutional amendments have very specific, complicated, and long journey. And it starts not only with the hearing, but it has to be taken up very early in the session. The vote has to happen pretty early. It has to go to a constitutional convention. And the process has to happen again the next session. And we should clarify what the vote in the House is next week. Uh, has the clerk, uh, have you talked with the clerk about the actual vote? I think, what, in what way? Um, so on most bills, mm -hmm. when it appears on the House floor, right. it's for a vote up or down, yes or no. Right. We agree with it. This vote is shall it appear oh, on the Constitutional Convention calendar. Right, so it's, it moves and it so along. It moves it along, but it's not the House voting on the substance. Oh, that's a very it's good point. It's voting on moving it to the next stage of the process. Right, so that's a great point because it means that members can actually vote for it without saying, I support it. They're just saying, I think that the Constitutional Convention Correct. can do it. So it's kicking that can down the road. And there's one other little twist here. Um, and that is that it doesn't automatically come to the floor for that action. A member has to request that it go 
to that next stage. So I think I've done that. Good. I think that's the report out um, yeah. request. Um, and it's coming up with other constitutional amendments. There's like Correct. maybe 10 or 12 of them. Right. One of them is the fair share amendment. That's yeah. terrific. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a constitutional amendment that um, I spoke in favor of that will be um, before us to vote, and that's to allow no excuse absentee voting, because that's mm -hmm. also something that has to amend the Constitution. My second amendment, however, was reported out ought not to pass, and that was the one that struck all the he's and replaced them with they's. And I decided not to pursue it. I could have. But I thought, you know what? If and when I get reelected, hopefully when, I'll bring it back the next session. And I actually flagged it for the chair of the Judiciary mm -hmm. Committee and said, I won't push it now, but I'll be coming back with it. But they did something with the oath amendment that was really terrific. In that section, it refers to public officials as he. And so when they amended it, they took out the he and they replaced it with the person. So they've already started nice. to chisel you, away you, at the you've language. You've already <laughs> gotten uh, a little toe in the water. That's right. That's so fantastic. Next time, maybe it won't be the he's to the they's. It'll be the he's to the person because we'll have already <laughs> done this good. one. Well, you know, it's not un it's very unusual for a first-term legislator to propose a constitutional amendment, and it's even more unusual for it to advance to actually get on the calendar. So I've heard that. uh, that's very exciting yeah, to hear that you took that initiative <laughs> and that you're building support for it. Okay, so now let's go to uh, something else. I read um, recently in the Daily Hampshire Gazette that you and Natalie Blay, mm -hmm. the new uh, state mm -hmm. representative from Franklin County, mm -hmm. Uh, co-authored a letter mm -hmm. uh, talking about the use of campaign funds for daycare. Yes, child care Could expenses. you uh, talk about that sure. a little bit? Sure. Um, on the federal level, you can um, use your campaign funds to pay for campaign-related child care expenses. So this is really about supporting parents who have small children to be able to run for public office. Um, because if they can't pay for them out of campaign funds, it's either a personal expenditure or they're bringing their kids along with them, which may be fine, but not in all cases. And also, sometimes parents get sort of subject to judgment about that. Mm -hmm. You know, why are they bringing their kids around with them? And so on the state level, though, you still can't use campaign-related funds for campaign-related child care expenses. And so this bill would allow that to happen. And I think some people think, oh, it's really important for moms and women. It's just really important for parents mm -hmm. um, who are thinking about running to know that they can raise funds that then can help them care for their kids so they can be able to turn their attention fully to the campaign and not mm -hmm. be at a disadvantage. Um, from that, and so I think it's a great bill. I'm happy to have supported it. Both Rep. Lay and myself supported it very early on. Um, we wrote the letter actually in response to another letter that sort of inferred maybe that we weren't supporters. So we thought, well, we should take the opportunity Make and let clear. people know. Mm -hmm. um, right now, that bill has not been scheduled for a hearing. It sits before the Joint Committee on Election Laws, and if people are interested, they should write to the Joint Committee and say. Let's have that up for a hearing so that we can bring it to the floor and allow it to be voted on. Great. Yep. Okay, so uh, let's uh, uh, shift gears here for a second, and I'm going to ask you a two-part question. Part one is, what's been the biggest disappointment so far in your whole 120 days as a state representative from the 3rd Hampshire District? I th you know, it's going to sound kind of um, hokey, but the biggest disappointment is how little work I get done on the commute back and forth. <laughs> I would so much rather be able to, I mean, there are a lot of people who do phone meetings and all sorts of ways to maximize their time, and I don't seem to be able to do that. So that's part of my disappointment. Is that because you're driving yourself? I'm driving myself. and. I end up wanting to catch up on the news during mm -hmm. that time because otherwise I don't know when I would. And so it becomes, it's great time to listen to podcasts and news, but not great time to be distracted with a meeting yeah. when I can't take notes from it. Right. Um, but I, you know, there haven't been too many disappointments. It's not like everything's lived up to my expectations because I'm not sure what my expectations were, but it's still incredibly fascinating and everything is an opportunity to learn. So it's going through that filter in terms of low points. Next time, I might give a little bit more thought to some juicy <coughs> low points. Um, <laughs> but right now, I think that's my, my major disappointment is that I'm not as productive in the commuting time and mm -hmm. I would like to be. If we had a train, I could be very uh, productive. If only we had the train. I could be very productive. And, and I, I appreciate the conversations you and I have had about East-West Rail mm -hmm. and your openness to the idea that we should be connecting 
both on northern and southern routes. Let's because, do it all. Yeah, because we need to be able to get people not just from Boston to Springfield to Pittsfield, but also from Boston to Greenfield yep. to Northampton, Absolutely. out to North Adams. Everywhere. So. And I actually had the opportunity to talk about that a little bit in my Committee on Bonds this week because we were talking about rail improvement. Right. And so I was able to talk about exi creating rail for mm -hmm. Western Massachusetts. Um, and, you know, what's interesting is, I, I don't know if this was there when you were there, Stan, but at the beginning of every committee meeting now, colleagues are complaining about how long it took them to get into Boston. People who live within 128, oh, it took me an hour and a half to get in, it took me two hours. And I think that's great because I think it's also pressing the issue of if it's taking you that long, mm -hmm. now you can get a better understanding of why we need commuter rail in Western Massachusetts. It's giving people real life experience. Yes, when I started, it was under two hours all the time. From here? From here, mm. under two hours. Of course, you've got the pedal to the metal right. but, or whatever the expression <laughs> is but but it's still it, it, and now um, how long is it typically depends on what time but generally two to two and a half yeah and uh, we, when we, I used to go in on Sunday evening and mm. stay over uh, at the apartment in Boston Sunday evening I'd get there an hour and three quarters I know then it's like nothing and then it was like nothing yeah. and as you say uh, the ride back and forth was decompression time right and now because of cell phones and Bluetooth right meetings constantly yes. on the phone constantly and keeping so track of those means when you're driving can be hard it'd be very difficult <laughs> so let's uh, let's end on a high note what's what in these hundred and twenty or so days was the highlight that you're most excited about and and most grateful for I think um, so in the beginning, a lot of the veteran legislators are saying, ask me anything you need. You know, if you have a question, ask me. And you don't really want to ask. But as the session is moving along, it's really impressive to me how incredibly generous my colleagues are, that they meant it. Like if I go back and ask them a question, they give me exactly what they think. Um, they don't hold back. And I appreciate their very direct feedback and the advice and, you know, it, it's a funny thing, right? Because coalitions are built on shared values, but it also can just be shared experience. Mm -hmm. So having the conversations with people around different topics, even if we don't come out with the same issue, is giving me an anchor sort of to go back to folks. And I'm appreciating the fact that, at least for now, everyone's making themselves available to that conversation. That's terrific. And so you've got the support of your constituents here. And when you're in Boston, you've got support and guidance from uh, the veterans who can tell you. And you don't have to follow their direction or advice, right. but at least you get the uh, and they're not expecting you to follow it or not and I have to say the flip side of that is working in conjunction with like Rep Lay and Senator Comerford and having this sort of regional partnership is quite amazing yeah. and wonderful I really I feel a, a, that the delegation some cohesiveness is key I don't know how we'd be doing it without it if anything. you if you don't stick together here you're not going to be effective there that's right Thank you very much for being with Thank us. You. And uh, this is our state representative, Mindy Dom. And uh, you can get her online. You can text her, email. Yes. Uh, she has many ways that uh, you can reach her. You can attend her office hours. They're published. So, uh, Mindy, keep up the great work. Thank and you, thank you very much for joining us this thank evening. Thank you.